Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Art of Storytelling with VR, brought to you by Samsung Canada. Allow me to introduce Philippe Dozier, the Director of Content and Services from Samsung Canada. Great, thanks, Joel. We uh, certainly appreciate everyone being here bright and early this morning. Uh, hopefully you didn't have two nights that were too, too rough. Uh, but look, it's like a full house. We have a great panel. Uh, and really our purpose for being here at Samsung is, is we're trying to bring VR to the masses, if you will, to broaden the audience, to create energy and excitement in the trade. Uh, we've got a very, very short video, I believe. So I'll keep this super quick. Nina, if you could run the video, I think it's kind of self-explanatory and we'll go from there. So there we go, we thought not a bad way to kick off the session and it's all about, of course, the Gear VR. I'll intro the panel very, very quickly. They've got a lot of interesting insights and thoughts to share with you and we'll have some Q&A at the very end. So to my immediate left, Jacques Mété, Subsolé President, which is a Media. joint, I'm sorry? Subsolé Media, which is a joint venture between Silk and Bell. So thanks for being here, Jacques. Patrick McGuire, Head of Content at Vice Canada. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Randy Lennox, which many of you I'm sure will know, president of uh, Bell Broadcasting. He has a very long title, we've shortened it to Bell Broadcasting. <laughs> and uh, J. Lee Williams, uh, who's produced some really cool VR content, Occupied VR. So, this being said, we'll kick it off with the very first question. Over to you, Randy. Mm. Uh, I had the privilege of attending the Bell Upfront. You made some really interesting announcements about VR. You talked about snackable TV. We're interested to get a sense of where you see VR fitting in the ecosystem. Is it companion content? Is it more of a standalone category? So feel free, what are your thoughts around that? Sure, you know, when we look at VR, and I've been a fan for a period of time, you know, um, it is the ultimate on-demand experience. You know, the viewer is in control of this experience, so all we can do is accentuate. So we have a commitment to VR in terms of integration, you mentioned a moment ago our, our joint venture with Cirque du Soleil is a great example. Talk about killer content right. for VR consumption. Yeah. You know, further, TSN and our sports properties. We're certainly looking at gaming. You know, one conversation we're having and taking seriously is, for example, the Amazing Race Canada. Perfect for VR. Right. You know, can we do a full hour of Amazing Race out of the gate? No, but is there a pivotal 10 minutes of action that we can put into VR process for mobile and for linear television? Absolutely. Fantastic. So we're very focused on it as a priority. Great. Thanks, Randy. Um, Patrick, so kind of a nice dovetail from your perspective. Viceland, you've done some cool VR content. <clears throat> How do you see the evolution of that game plan moving forward? Yeah, well, we just finished production on our first VR project out of Canada, and we did it as a bit of an experiment because we had a really interesting documentary opportunity where we invited uh, Prime Minister Trudeau to Shoal Lake 40, which is a First Nations community that is one of 100 without water access. And uh, given the empathy that we want to generate around that issue, we thought that VR would be an awesome way to help tell the story. So we actually brought Jay and his crew out with us and uh, had a bit of a dance between the documentary crew and the VR crew. But what we ended up with was its own standalone 10 minute documentary VR experience slash film that touches on, you know, different parts of the story that the, the flat doc didn't really get to. And uh, we're actually previewing <coughs> it here around the corner after Very the cool. panel, so check it out. Um, but, you know, generally I, I think it, that Randy's right uh, with the strategy that you have to take, you know, we're not gonna fill a 44 minute 
uh, slot with, with just VR content. But given that so much of our programming is so stunning and visual and access based, we really want to uh, engage it as much as possible so that our viewers can see what our documentary crews are seeing and, and really take that storytelling further. Very cool. So actually a nice to go from there over to you, Jay. Yeah. Um, so you've produced a lot of your content. Uh, you've worked with a bunch of brands. Yeah. How do you bridge the gap between what, when a brand sort of sees a piece as a 2D piece and then you're trying to bring it to the next level, which is VR. So any sort of key learnings, things yeah. you picked well, up I on. Mean, the, the funny thing about uh, working with brands is like, uh, you know, if you rewind maybe two and a half years ago, uh, and they're all t attached to agencies, we were, you know, our, our door was being like knocked down by agencies that wanted to get in to see the VR. Uh, so we'd bring them in and we'd show, you know, give them a demo and they would just be like, this is amazing. I can't wait to tell the brand, like whatever brand they're, they're interested in, in pitching it to. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call you next week. We can't wait. We can't. They're su super excited. And then silence. And this, like, this went on. Like, and we met everybody. And, this, and everybody went silent. And then maybe about six to eight months later, they all started coming back. And I think the difference was is because the agencies didn't have the headsets, right? And that's really the selling point to sell to any brand, right? And then now, you know, now, now everyone's coming again and knocking, banging down our door again, this time with the knowledge. And I, what I'm finding, I mean, you know, all, most of you guys here, I mean, have given us an opportunity. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, received the first much fact from VR with Andy Kim from you guys. Uh, we're doing some great work with Samsung and, uh, and Vice has given us a great opportunity with the documentary. So I think it's the brands that are in tune with you know, with the VR, with the, uh, the target market that's, that's picking it up. Uh, those are the ones that are understanding. And I find that a lot of the brands, too, that didn't have knowledge before, they're all starting to bring people in-house, at least one person. You know, there's always, uh, they're always picking one person that kind of gets it. And then that person sort of translating to all the brand managers right. or whatnot, uh, you know, how to move forward with VR. So you're seeing an evolution, obviously. Oh, yeah, it's great. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Jacques. Uh, Silk Sunday, obviously, very well-known brand. Uh, no need to get into any great detail. Everyone knows the brand. So how do you bridge the gap between a live show, which is all about storytelling, and the VR pieces that you've produced? So are there similarities, dissimilarities? Do you try to direct the audience or not direct the audience? Because there's a lot going on. So how do you see the evolution from your perspective? Well, there are uh, similarities. Uh, there are some parallels. Uh, search shows always... Uh, include uh, some tableaus, some ensembles, where a lot of things are happening, where you have an A story or a key story uh, that uh, you're directed to look at, and then all sorts of other things happening around. But in, uh, in, in live shows, uh, all of this is happening in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, wherever you are in the audience, everything is in front of you. In VR, if you use it to its full extent, uh, you have the ability to stage things all around. Uh, you never go see a show all around. Uh, any show is usually in front of you. You can be very close and, 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 and be, just swivel a little bit your head. But in VR, you, you better off standing on a swivel chair if you want to enjoy everything, uh, if the content has been made that way because you know there are things in front of you, let's call that in front, but there are things there above and below. So that's where the parallel stops, I think, and the fun begins as far as we're concerned because uh, it's uncharted waters. We need to find different ways to uh, keep the interest of the audience, uh, to tell a story, to find a way that will direct the attention of the viewer to what we think is the key story. Uh, so that, that is really where it starts, and, you know, and, and we were interested in VR the minute we, we, we saw that it was available, that some real devices were available to create something interesting. We, we started with a, a very simple test, and eventually with Samsung actually, and with a studio in Montreal called uh, Felix and Paul Studio, they're very, very good at doing 360 stereoscopic experience, so you really have a sense that you're there. So we're, 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 we've started exploring this. How do, you, how do you tell a story not just in front of you mm -hmm. like we've seen all of our lives? And that is, I think, the, the beginning of the VR story. I guess it's a great point because it's almost a redefinition. What's the lexicon for VR? Traditional filmmaking has its own lexicon. VR is a different space, and we're having Completely. to invent new terms and new terminology. So that's interesting. So back to you, Patrick, maybe switching gears a little bit on the news front. So I know you guys are doing a lot of news clips in VR. 
Where do you see news fitting in the whole ecosystem and kind of growing that space? Are you, are you seeing this as sort of an in-field raw production in the moment? Or is it a combination of that and a more slick studio production combination? Yeah, well, it's interesting you bring up the lexicon point because our first <coughs> VR project that Vice did globally was by Spike Jones, who's got an Oscar or two maybe. And he made the same comment. He said this is like a new grammar of filmmaking. So even for someone like him, the you know, uh, possibilities and the execution of this medium were confusing. Um, and what he did was very simple. He just went out and did a raw shoot at the Eric Garner protests in New York last year. So that's how we're starting because it's also how we started doing video documentaries in the first place. Finding something that we really wanted to tell a story about, sending a camera and, and seeing what we got. And that's more or less what we did with the, the documentary that you'll be able to see um, later this morning. But you know, th we're also exploring, okay, well, what is the best way to deliver a fact board? You know, like, uh, what is the best way that we can take this sit-down interview and add, uh, like, some lighting effects so that it feels more like a 3D environment? So even though you, we are doing a lot of the more traditional sort of doc-style shots in the VR, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to sort of spice it up a little bit without it looking uh, over-polished. And then, of course, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with different types of cameras. Um, they have a setup called the Johnny Six, which is you know a little more heavy. Uh, it's it's a it's a set of GH4s, and um, you know you can't just necessarily take it anywhere. But then you know we have a scene where um, Prime Minister Trudeau is is out delivering water in Shoal Lake 40, and we just used a little GoPro rig there and, and set it on the side. So it, it's just a, it's a whole new toolkit. Um, you need to be really adaptive to your um, environment, just like any kind of documentary filmmaking. And I, and I think the end result, like I mentioned before, and we hear this a lot with VR, but it's true, it, it's, it's empathy. Um, and the first time I really understood that was when I watched Clouds Over Sidra, which is, I believe, a UNICEF co-production that's in the New York Times or, or VRSE app, one of those. But uh, you're in a Syrian refugee camp and you're hearing a story narrated by a 12-year-old girl and it's like, the most intense uh, emotive experience that I'd had in a, in, a, in a film in a long time. So I think it's really real and, and we're excited to you know, deliver some of these hard hitting news stories in a way that people are not gonna be necessarily expecting. Very good, so we'll, uh, we'll go a little bit off script because you mentioned the Johnny Six. So maybe we should explain to the audience, Jay, I've had a chance to see the Johnny Six. It's a really cool rig. Yeah. Was I under it? NDA for that or could yeah. I have mentioned it? Yeah. Yeah. You said it's awesome. Good, good, good. Well, we've, 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 we've actually advanced it since that shoot, so uh, we're no longer with the GH4s. We're working with uh, the guts of cameras now. But uh, yeah, the Johnny Six is really cool. It's something that we've been developing. I mean, my, my background's film so, and, and visual effects for you know, over a decade prior to VR. Um, and, and playing with cameras, uh, we just like the toys a lot, you know. Uh, but the Johnny Six is a really cool camera. So what it is, it's uh, we call it Johnny Six because it looks like Johnny Five from the movie Short Circuit. Um, it, it looks like a robot. Uh, well, it is kind of a robot. It, it's on a drone base with wheels. Uh, it has a self stabilization unit. Uh, it's self lighting, uh, talkback system, uh, and basically it does stitch to stream from the actual um, robot itself and sends that signal back to a black box which uh, is in another room or wherever you're off site uh, where the driver is in a headset and can actually drive it uh, while the director sits next to him uh, and is in another headset and can direct from from the, the thing through the robot to the, to the people. And we keep advancing it. We also like build our own drones, uh, you know, um, any kind of camera, underwater cameras, you know, whatever. we. I guess a lot of the cameras that came out, everyone was starting with GoPros and stuff. Um, you know, uh, they just weren't, I mean, the, the stitching was there and everything was kind of there, but the quality wasn't there. So we just sort of been advancing and like to understand the math behind, um, I guess, the way the camera brings in the footage and, and how you receive that in a headset. And uh, I guess working with the cameras and building our own rigs and stuff like that really helped us understand that, that sort of the technology behind what we're working with, you know? Very cool. So we'll, uh, we just want to lay a bit of a base, and then we'll go to Q&A very shortly. Randy, yes. uh, I, I believe you've got a bit of a background in music, unless I'm, unless I'm mistaken. <laughs> so, so tell us, where do you see VR sitting in the music space? Uh, much fact, you've commissioned to produce some titles. Do you see that as a logical extension? Yeah, I'm very happy to say much fact has now you know, helped nine VR uh, oh, content nine, okay. videos so far, cool. which is great. So, you know, I mentioned at the top that I was that I fell in love early. I fell in love 
watching a music VR by a Montreal artist by the name of Patrick Watson. Right. They Great created job. it for Oculus. Yep. And they had me come into Montreal about two and a half years ago and look at this thing. I was just blown away by it. There's a dog in the yeah, corner. The, the dog is it, cool. It's a fascinating yeah. piece. So I then called um, uh, a friend of mine in the UK and said, how do we have an immersive experience here in theater? So we started to, to test certain things. We used The weekend at this point, the song you had, The Hills. And we sort of almost got there. And what it was was really setting up VR cameras and having a concert experience, as, as Jacques said, which is fully 360, but also inclusive of the intimacy of backstage. Right. So, you know, take, right. take the weekend in London and have that experience on VR, but make sure you're also getting everything that happens in and around it. Right. So that's where that's going. And we've, um, we're the Canadian rights holder for a thing called iHeartMedia. And iHeart is where we're going to take VR. We're going to start putting on a series of concerts, and VR will be on the 2.0 of it, a part right. of that process. So we'll be able to bring that back and run that through our Bell Media assets. So I'm very, it'll be 2017, but I'm very excited about that prospect. Very cool. Because um, that's next level in terms right. of the music. Love it. Love it. Uh, Jacques, very briefly, if you can elaborate a little bit more on the whole storytelling piece, because there seems to be two different schools of thought. Do you want to formally direct the viewer to specific areas within the 360 immersive experience, or do you want the viewer to just self-discover? So like, I know you spoke to it a little bit earlier, but maybe elaborate as to where you see that. Look, it, it, it's, it's a new technology and it's a new world. It's, nothing is forbidden. We, we have to try you know, all sorts of things, and I think that you know, <clears throat> like they're doing documentaries, i.e. they're bringing the VR device wherever the action happens. What we've decided to do as our first step is to create an experience express just for VR. So from the very beginning, we decided to stage things around the viewer, uh, to take the viewer in a world. So we, you know, Cirque as, as a stage organization, we're used to creating elaborate tableaus, as I was saying earlier, and we use the stage tools uh, solos, performance, group numbers, dance numbers, music, lighting, and we use all of these tools that are well known, they've been known to humanity for a long time, mm -hmm. to direct the attention of the viewer to a certain thing so that we can tell a story. So, but, but with VR, as I was saying, that everything is happening all around, you know, you're sure that if you're looking this way, you're missing what's happening there. Right. If right. you're taking an action that's starting there and going there, and the other one goes there, then right. the two stories may may meet. So we're trying to to understand how to create this in a way that will be interesting for the viewer, taking into account the fact that in VR you can watch several times the same thing right. and maybe five minutes becomes 25 minutes and maybe 10 minutes becomes 40 minutes because by the time you've looked at everything, you know, you will have had to see it quite a few times. So our experience in making tableaus and telling a story inside the tableau is useful but we saw the limit very well, and we started, you know, investigating possibilities. We tried a first thing, which was, I would say, rather simple, but worked very well. And now we're getting on to do things a, a, a lot more complicated. I, I think that the tools <coughs> of the stage, funny enough, are more useful in this instance than the tools of the movies. Uh, in the movies, the maker, the movie maker decides what the audience is going to see in what order. And there's very little room for the viewer to go away from what has been decided by the filmmaker. If you're doing a VR experience that is really all around you, then that tool does not work anymore. You cannot decide that now is the time for a close-up on right. the killing hand. Right. Uh, the killing hand is somewhere, maybe it's behind you, maybe it's in front of you. So that's what we're exploring right now. And, and, and we're using brains from various parts of the storytelling, writers, directors, uh, stage directors, and so on, and mixing all of this. And that makes a very interesting mix, by the way. Well, just to pick up on that, back over to you, Jay. So tell us about some of the tips, tricks, hacks, things that, you, and you've learned a lot over the last couple of years 
things like the horizon line oh, yeah, and, and yeah. the concern over dizziness and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, to rewind again back to the, the beginning when, when, like, the first Oculus shipped, uh, you know, it was really compelling. Uh, and uh, the first thing I tried was, uh, was a roller coaster. And I actually felt vertigo, like my stomach drop. And I, there was just something undeniable about that, you know? And so, um, so I was just, like, I was, went from film and I went directly into VR. I was just like, okay, this is a medium that I have to explore. Uh, and the fact that there were, there were some cameras, too, that we could play with. So, um, uh, you know, we, we were working with that. Um, and the, the thing was is that we were, actually had to make ourselves sick like eight times a day, like, like no, literally, and because of, <laughs> no, and it was, uh, it was like latency issues and all sorts of like, like horizon line, like unstabilized horizon line when it's noodling, uh, that makes you sick. So, so we literally had to make ourselves sick. Uh, then we'd go to sleep for about 15 minutes, reset our body. Our body would reset, wake up, and then do it again. And my whole studio was doing that. Well, I mean, at the time it was like maybe the three or four of us at that at that time. I, I pulled a couple guys, and uh, and and we were like, it, it made us really angry. Like we were really getting in like this weird mood. Like people would come up and they're like, "Hey, man, you're you know you're a happy guy. Like what's wrong with you?" I'm just like, "It's not you, man. It's just VR." You know, like, and, and, and that, yeah, really. And then that went on for for quite a while. And then I started having like weird dreams like <laughs> dreams I had no body and dreams of double eyed dream. like just it was really we were like and I was I literally it's, I think I was sleeping for three hours a night for about 18 months trying to figure out because uh, I figured everyone in the world that tried VR was going to be like going after it so uh, you know I put myself in a cave made myself sick 18 months straight and uh, and they came out I'm like okay let's make some VR and I realized that not many people had done that okay. uh, so we, we learned a lot uh, wonder why we learned a lot and then we start, some you know, people for the last... may not be feeling too well this morning right <laughs> yeah, now yeah, yeah, we're not sure yeah yeah, yeah. in the last uh, couple years we've just been working around how to not make people sick and so right. at Occupy we spend uh, a lot of time <laughs> it does no, we, not make you sick about 10, uh, 10 or 15% of our time is spent just figuring right. out anti-sickness things like uh, <clears throat> like the Johnny Six has its own self-stabilization system so that the horizon line is always straight or we figured out like took about six months how to stabilize horizon lines inside of uh, you know in post what is the threshold in other words is it sort of seven or eight minutes as it starts to get weary or no you I'll find people like pulling headsets off like within minutes man if, if it's okay if it's making, so sooner than that. I mean and latency is a huge issue that's more when you're like working in the game like not so much film but in the gaming area uh, you know if you have too much stuff going on in your thing right. and it, it starts chugging like or uh, even just game controller movement, like there's all these things, like we built right. something called, uh, a partner of mine uh, built something called CloudStep, which instead of, uh, you know, you have your Xbox controller, instead of just moving forward and, and, and rotating and stuff, it, it just sort of, it, it steps you forward, and we found that that, that takes away all of the sickness in terms Great. of using a controller. So there's simple things that we can play with. Thanks, Steve, that was good. So uh, we'll pause there, uh, throw it over for some questions. There's a couple of mics, I believe, so feel free. If you've got some short, crisp questions, we don't have a lot of time. But please do ask the audience. I can't really see if hands are up because the lights are pretty bright. I think right here. Uh, but I think there's some hands in the yeah, middle. Right. Please go ahead. So in terms of cost, how expensive is it to create VR? Ah, uh, yes, the cost question uh, right always cost. comes up. So here we go. Uh, I could try. Go, that. go ahead, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to create. We had our what they call an upfront, which is presenting our new shows last week, and we wanted to go and create. 90 seconds worth of VR content for it. And it's very, very expensive. It's to really do it properly, it's you know six figures to create it. So there is no delusion here that this is not expensive to do. So it's Wagons West. We're trying to figure out, just like the glasses will start big and over time get smaller, so will the evolution of cost. So today it is prohibitive, eh? Yeah, you, know, it's, it's, you can do cheap and cheerful versions. But to really do it right, it can, it's, it's expensive for now. It's tricky. I mean, we were lucky to partner with the NFB and the CFC to right. make our documentary, and they were amazing partners and continue to be. Our cheap and cheerful version of it is going to just be when a reporter goes out to a story that's particularly visual, yeah. right. they get a 360 camera with them, and right. at least we have like a 10 to 30 second visual that the right. viewer can sort of explore. And so we're trying to integrate 360 throughout our content, uh, the big versions like the doc we're making, but little yeah. stuff too, so our audience gets used to it. Right. Uh, I would like to add, Go ahead, John. the cost of technology right now is quite high, especially if you want to do it stereoscopic. But this, as for all the technologies, will go down really, really fast. So I think that very soon you'll be looking at 
basically the same cost as doing something good with anything. You know, you can shoot with a very high definition camera, something extremely boring, and spend loads of money. And with the same equipment, you can shoot something very, very inexpensive and extremely interesting. So I think these rules will apply to this uh, yeah. sooner than later. The, right now, the obstacle is, is technology. To do something right, makes it takes a lot of time in post production the rendering is 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 a long proposal here because very 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 soon you have to get into rotoscopy and all sorts of crazy things of, of the ninth, of the 20th century uh, but all of this i think will fade pretty fast one example jacques is that 4k hdr 6 months ago yep was a 30 to 35% cost premium and today it's a wash today you right. can make yeah. 4k content right. for virtually the same so it just shows how quickly that does change yeah and so, and you can shoot 360 with, oh, that camera that's there, which we were about to put in market. Sorry for the crass commercial plug. <laughs> is is there one for the audience, Phil? I just, <laughs> I thought it sort of fit the conversation. Well, and also it kind of seems like <laughs> the software sucks. Thank you for sucks, allowing right? me. Yeah, too, is the other problem. Anyway. Uh, okay, so another question here. If we could grab the mic, please. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I was really curious about the, the notion of a sort of static audience versus a, a moving audience. So I come from game design, and one of the things that games give us is this great sense of directing the viewer and the, well, actually the player into her next steps and her next action. So uh, the part of me was thinking when you were talking about design approaches and design languages for VR was looking at the language of level design, for example, as a way of directing. So that then led me to my question, which is how much VR experience do you feel at the moment assumes a static viewer, as in somebody who's still, versus somebody who's moving through the VR experience um, to get to a particular end point? And right. I'm not really just talking about the distinction between games and film, I'm just right. talking about maybe how theatre and film people are thinking about the viewer moving through the space. But, I mean, in terms of, sorry, in terms of like new grammar, I, I think game designers could help a lot with, with making this content yeah. um, as engaging as possible. And I'll be super quick, but I just watched a National Geographic piece about caves and these bioluminescent worms in these caves. But if you look in the wrong place, it's like, hey, look up. And if you, like literally text, that's like you're looking in the wrong place. And that, that had a very video gamey feel to it. Um, with documentary, obviously, we are still kind of working in like a static but 360 environment. So, uh, yeah, I mean. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, so you've talked about how expensive it is in the development time and not just time, but money. Um, have any of you looked into government incentives, whether it's development, technology, even film tax credits, either provincial, federal, local, anything like that? We'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> Not a ton of empathy there for that. It's a great idea, but you know, yeah. <laughs> we're, work, we're working on it. There's a lot of uh, you know organizations and stuff. Uh, you know, being in film, you'd always have to go after and try to get the money. But it, the first time ever, you know, working in VR, I've had like uh, you know Bell Fund or or just you know a whole bunch of them just come up to me and say, how can we attach VR to what we're doing? And uh, you know, like going into the you know, the, the CMF. Um, and having like talks with them or um, you know telefilm uh, you know things like that they're they're all very interested in how to uh, translate their funds into uh, to, so other people can receive them to make virtual reality which is great I think it's amazing. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no. These are these are early. These are talks that we're uh, just having probably in the last eight months, and they're starting to implement them now. Um, I mean, much fact actually was the first one to take a to yeah, leave we a give faith. out money. To give it to give money, um, and I think the, um, the CMF uh, is is sort of uh, lined up now. They're they're starting to give money too, uh, and uh, I think Telefilm's probably next. Uh, I mean, it's it's so it seems you know the, with the conversations I've been hearing. Yeah. So since we're almost out of time, uh, closing comments: Where you see VR, dearest <laughs> panelists, in the next few years? Quick sort of. I, yeah, I think second, cheaper and more seconds. accessible is totally right. And um, come visit us around the corner in front of the Cascade Room to see what Jay and I really, I've been I'd like, to, I'd like yeah, to see with that. With the yeah. NFB and the CFC. Yeah, I'm also advocating. I think it's slow and steady wins the race. I think the big issue is the wagons west of it is let's get high quality content so we don't ruin the trajectory. Because everybody's going to jump in it and we've got to keep the quality high. Great. 
Yeah. And I think the end of this year will be very telling. Uh, when, when, when all the gear hit the market, we'll see how the market responds. Uh, but I, 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 I definitely agree that we, the producers, must make sure that what's out there is of the highest level yeah. to convince the public. I mean, as a developer, Do you I'm have really, an opinion, Jay? Yeah, I, have, I mean, as a developer, I'm really excited about all of the, <clears throat> the input that people are putting into the, on the tech side and, and like even just plugins for After Effects or... or um, uh, you know, you name it, like um, Premiere, uh, they're really starting to really take a focus, really starting to understand uh, what, we're, what we've been looking at. I mean, when we first started, we, we had to, uh, there was no pipeline for making a 360 video. So we actually, like I actually had to take my pre-existing pipeline for visual effects and then figure out our own pipeline. And, and now there's all these tools, I mean, that save a lot of time. I, I've, I've wasted a lot of time. I wish I had these tools earlier. And I, I'm just excited about the, the stuff that's coming out. Yeah. We've taken it down to the eight second, seven second. Thank you for attending the panel discussion today. It's an early morning session. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, sir. Thank you.